overcast. This is a. Uh... <laughs> Guys, Guys in head, jump my hook. Ho, ho, ho. Fry a pan fish. Let's put him in the box. Hey, what's up, guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and today we're out here on New Malona's Reservoir to do a little top lineup for some trout. This is dead of the winter, so this is what we do. Those fish are in the top 10 to 15 foot of the water column, so we're not even using downriggers. We're running them straight back from our lines out to our baits. So I'll break down all the methods, show you how we're doing it. So let's hop onto the water with the guys and I, crack some of these wintertime trout. That means we're gonna serve this fish. If we find any bait balls down deep or find consistent fish arching down deep, then we'll change up the plan. But always gotta look for bait first. Okay, now let's get into some of the lures that we're gonna be using when we're top lining out there. Um, what I do is I go through basically three different setups of lures. Like if I'm targeting big fish, if I'm trying to find more fish, I'm trying to find active fish, or if I'm on a school of fish, then I do another system completely around. So first things first, let's go through targeting fish. So we're gonna be fishing fast in the beginning. We're looking for fish, we're looking for obvious signs. Um, in the winter time when we're top lining, we're looking for fish actively feeding on the surface, fish jumping, uh, birds working. If you don't see any of that, the thing you can do is start searching in coves. Look for coves. You get in there, the water tends to be a little bit warmer still in the coves. It's shallow where it heats up faster. There's more shoreline versus water. So you're gonna get the water temperature to heat up faster. There's gonna be runoff, things to draw the fish in there. Um, that's if you just can't find them, you know, looking out on open water and look for, you know, rings in the water and fish actively feeding on the surface. That being said, we're going to want to fish fast to start. Um, so fish fast baits, like, uh, you know, rip baits, like these husky jerks right here shad wraps, we can pull these things two and a half, three miles an hour. If you want to maintain three miles an hour and even go up to three, two, three, five to just score a reaction strike and find fish fast, if you don't notice, notice any of those obvious signs, I pull these small P-line laser minnows. They're heavy for their size. They got great hooks on them right out of the box. These things will stay under the surface. These fish are in the top 10 feet of the surface. You can pull that at 3.5 and this thing will still stay a foot under the surface with 60, 70 foot back from your rod. So that's a killer setup right there. Uh, other lures that I like to pull. I like to pull the Shasta Tackle Crip Lure. This is a fantastic lure for triggering strikes. Um, what I will do is if I'm pulling it at three miles an hour, it's real fast. Sometimes it'll come up and get outside the surface. So I'll put about a two or three foot leader on there and I'll take a half ounce egg weight and put it up above a barrel swivel, just like a Carolina rig. Now I can pull that at three miles an hour, and that'll be about a foot or two under the surface until I get bit. Now there's a variety of baits that we can use. We can still use the same baits if we're getting bit, going that speed. That speed may be crucial, but what'll happen is once I get bit in that area and then I make it through and I stop getting bit, I know that general target area where I was at. So now I'm gonna go back through, Fish a little bit slower. I'll run flashers. Uh, some people know these as fenders with the night crawler behind them. Um, I'll run the the baby spoon right here. This is the doctor spoon by Yellowbird Products. This thing's a killer in the video. You'll see me hammering all sorts of trout on this guy right here. Uh, the Shasta Tackle Wiggle Hoochie. These things are phenomenal. I can pull all these baits that I'm showing you right here at 1.5 to 1.8 miles an hour, which is much slower, and I can stay in that active feeding area for those fish. Um, the Scorpion Spinners by Shasta Tackle. Vibration and spinners put off a lot of attraction value for trout. Rainbow trout key in on vibration and water displacement. Um, if I go through there and I'm not getting bit on a variety of these baits, if I'm not getting bit, the thing I'll do is drop down to 1.2 or 1.3 miles an hour. I'll pull a woolly bugger on monofilament so it stays on top of the surface or a little tiny nymph fly and see if they're reacting just to the bugs. You know, so I have my fast pattern where I'm gonna move through and find them. If I don't get hit that way, I'm gonna go to sit, find those same active spots and pull those other baits that I can pull a little bit slower and more effectively. Um, now let's say I'm catching a lot of short fish and I wanna look for that bigger bite. 
This is where I love these new P-Line kicker minnows. These are the four inch right here. These things are phenomenal. If you ever hear about people rolling shad, you can nose hook these with like a, a size one hot mosquito hook and hammer big old trout on these bad boys. Also, the wiggle hoochie is also known for catching big trout. They displace a lot of water, they kick back and forth. That'll get you a big bite. Um, the bigger the bait, the bigger the fish. You know, you ever heard of that? Big baits catch big fish. Well, it's true. Um, the spoons, this has a big profile. When they see this flashing around, that's going to attract a bigger fish nine times out of ten. So let's say we went for the bigger fish. We can't get the bigger fish. The only way we're getting them is on these medium-sized baits, but we need more attraction value. We need something that's going to pull them close. Your flashes are getting bit, but not getting as bit as you often want to. A lot of the time, guys will tell you in the winter, when it gets down below 50 degrees and into the upper 40s, they're gonna start using dodgers again. This right here is a sling blade dodger by Shasta Tackle. These are great in the winter time when the water reaches that upper 40s, 49, 48, 47, anywhere around there, that's when you wanna move back into those coves again and start using the sling blades uh, with hoochies behind them. If you wanna target those trout in the winter, spinner hoochies, see this little clevis on top of here with the little spinner blade, little uh, willow leaf blade right there? That puts off a lot of vibration. It's that spin that those trout like. They'll hone in and they'll eat that bad boy up. So I got about a three foot, 100% fluorocarbon leader, my uh, P-line here, going to this little shad wrap. And all I'm gonna tie is the uh, double surgeon's loop knot. You get a lot more action out of your bait with uh, any sort of loop knot. You know, whatever you prefer to tie. Double surgeon's really about 85, 90% knot strength. But, you know, I'm fishing a crankbait with treble hooks. I'm not overly worried about knot strength because I'm not going to be hoisting the fish when I'm using a bait with treble hooks in the first place. You can go ahead and then tie a bait onto the bottom of there. Uh, improved clinch knots, really good for fluorocarbon. Snail knots, pretty good for fluorocarbon. Uh, the Palomar is too, but a lot of people have a problem when they cinch up the Palomar knot. One of the, when the lines go through the eye next to each other, a lot of people do it to where one line ends up crossing. So there's a couple little adjustments you have to do, but you could screw up potentially doing the Palomar on a fluorocarbon. So a good habit is do the improved clinch knot or a double surgeon's loop if you're gonna be fishing treble hooks. Okay. Yeah, other one's top. That planer board flipped over out of the way. It, it, it popped yeah. the release. I was looking to the side, trying to figure out where my planer board was at. And I look back behind me and I see it bouncing on the bouncing on the surface. Nice little wintertime rainbow. Not bad to start the day off with. No. We'll upgrade on size shortly. Of course. Looks fresh, man. Let's beer <laughs> grills this thing. Yeah. I mean, you... Oh, it looks like he's already got a chomp out of his back right there. Oh. Some big bass or some big brown like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now what happened here was I was in the middle of setting up the planer board and I had literally set the line about 20, 25, 30 foot back from the boat and as I go to clip on the planer board this other trout hammers it and I hook him up while holding on to the line and you can see we're in the middle of a really chaotic moment and Doug's got a trout in his hand over there at this point we couldn't keep these things off you can't keep them off so you're gonna see us pulling these bad boys a lot of the time. If you don't know what this is, this is a planer board. This is for pulling your baits out perpendicular to your boat, well, almost perpendicular, as you're trolling along. Let's say you cast out 50, 60 feet, or you let out 50, 60 feet behind the boat. What you do is you open up this snap swivel on the back, close your line in there, then you take your line up from there, go to the little Scotty quick release, pinch it up in there, and then lower it down next to your boat with a little bit of tension, and you'll see it. Look at this video clip here. And now you see how, it, as I start to load a little bit of tension on the rod, the planer board starts moving out to the side of the boat, and that'll move your bait out in the way, and it'll allow you to fish a lot more lines comfortably. Um, look at this link that I'm gonna put here at the bottom of the screen. If you wanna learn how to use the planer boards, go ahead and click that now, and it'll take you there, and you can still come back to this video. A good smack there. Best one yet. Today. 
And a set of flashes on there. Maybe a little bit more drag than regular lure alone. He's just about, just about tired of Oh, one last little kick at him. Okay, here we go. Buddy. Into the ego. Oh, yeah. Long range weaponry. Here you go, net. Net down. He's got like a high guy. There we go. Yeah, I'm gonna have to take and adjust that uh, that clip just a touch. That was on that uh, that spinning hook. It's got that that twisting hook on it. A little uh, offset, little, Kaylee little, Aberding. A little uh, slow death. Woo. Little guy. Yeah. Nothing big, but oh, oh, it's a coconut. Look at that. December 16th coconut. He is running to the, he's running to the right. Ah, he's coming back. Okay, here we go. He's coming back now. Another, another little small one. Now the rods that we're gonna be using, a lot of the time we're gonna be using these Okuma SST Kokanee rods for the smaller baits. If we're using small baits, small hooks, small treble hooks, we need to have a lot of limberness to that rod, a big moderate action, moderate bending right in the middle of the rod right there. That's gonna give us a lot of cushion. It's not gonna rip the hooks free. Um, it's gonna give us a lot of good load onto the fish. It's gonna allow it to build up without ripping anything free of them. Um, if we're using a little bit bigger hook, like I'm using a spoon like this with a bigger treble hook, I'm not going to be using the kokanee setup anymore. I'm going to be using the Akuma SST trout setup, which has a little bit more body to it. It's, uh, it's that middle weight of those rods right there, and that's going to give you a little bit more plant on that hook and a little bit more power to penetrate on. But remember, small treble hooks, uh, things like that, the kokanee rods are real good. Um, if you look at these smaller rip baits right here, the kokanee rod's real good. You start getting into your bigger rip baits, your trout rods are going to be a little bit better. And all that's going to do is maintain a good cushion on the fish uh, with your rod blank. A lot more sensitivity, you'll be able to detect more bites and land more fish that way. Uh, moving on from the rods, ah, one last thing. Rod length is crucial when you're top lining. If you look in the video, you're going to see the rod holders down to the side and the rods are pointed out to the side. You want your rods in a downward position. If your rods are up in the rod holder, the bare minimal setback you need is 100 feet. Because what's happening, your lure, if your rod's up, your lure is going to be running at this angle. The further line, the further more line you have out there, your lure is going to start to pull back down into the natural position. Um, so the minimal, if your rod's in a vertical vertical position, 100, I like 125, 130. You can push it depending on how much line you have on your reel there. Um, if your rods are in a down sideways position, the bare minimal when you're top lining, I say is 80 feet. Um, so keep those in mind. What that's going to do is sometimes your boat comes through, these fish are real shallow, you're going to carve them out and that's going to allow them time to come back in there, not be spooked by the boat and take it at that point. I didn't explain the reels to you. And when I say 80 feet, a lot of people are going to look at the reels and the and the level line going back and forth. A lot of the time on some reels, your level line doesn't go back and forth when you release it. You can see how many times the line goes back across your spool. But when it comes to trolling, get line counter reels. These things are fantastic. It'll tell you exactly where your bait is. So you'll know in relation to your other baits, are they all right next to each other? Am I trolling a giant cluster that's confusing these fish? With line counter reels in clear water, let's say it's 20 foot visibility out there through the water you're at the boat ramp you can see down 20 foot deep the bare minimal you need on your lures is at least 20 30 feet to where they're not getting confused you want something covering here there 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 to where you have a full array of baits out there and nothing confusing one another not making them make a choice but instead selecting that one selecting that one and you'll really be able to hone down on a pattern that way here we go fish on the fly Get down, you must come out of the water, creature. Oh! Fish off the fly. Okay, now let's cut for a quick commercial break and then get back to smacking some trout.
Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and when it comes to spooling up my reels, I choose nothing less than the best, and that's why I use P-Line each and every time. Are you fishing the best? Hey, Ryan, baby. <laughs> Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Poll, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. Ever tried pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today so go to www.rustylures.com have you had the chance to fish the baddest hoochie on the market today that's right i'm talking about the shasta tackle wiggle hoochie one of the most dynamic reaction trout and salmon lures that runs second to no other for pulling and triggering fish into striking so i guess the real question is are you catching all the fish you should be catching thanks for watching guys now let's get back to top lining looks like we came to fill a frying pan yep i love this Ready? He is not happy. Coming at you. There we go. Got a little pan fryer. Yep. Nothing at all wrong with that. Up there is extra delicious. Yeah, that little tiny did not over here. He's on. Fish on. Woo! He's been away. Go, Andrew. Might be a better one right here. <laughs> My first clam board fish. Fantastic. Yellow yeah, bird. Yeah. I'm gonna have you take two steps to your right, Andrew. Right. Oh, that's perfect. Right there. It's coming in pretty good. And take one step backwards for me. And keep the rod over my head. And more to the left. There you go. Keep reeling. Keep reeling. Keep reeling. Keep reeling. I got him. Oh, 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 oh. oh, that's a fatty. Hey. Better one for today. Okay, when we're top lining here, the lines that we're going to use. And if I'm pulling the fly, I told you I'll pull something with a little bit more mono in it, like the uh, P-Line CXX, just a lighter, you know, that's... If I'm pulling a fly, I'm going to be putting on four pound test and it's going to be on that kokanee rod to get it up there, make it move naturally. And when you tie to your fly, use a double surgeon's loop knot to where that fly can move around naturally. And when the wind blows, it'll skip that fly across the top of the water. You get a lot more strikes. But when we're trolling the plugs, I want to line with a little bit of density to it. I don't want 100% fluorocarbon. It's just too, too stiff. Um, it doesn't move around completely naturally. I use fluorocarbons as leaders, or if I'm pulling a bait at a faster speed, I'll use fluorocarbon. But when I'm top lining in the winter, I use eight pound fluor clear line. This is even when I'm fishing browns or rainbows, top lining, eight pound fluor clear. The line has a good percentage of fluorocarbon in it. It's a mixture, it's a copolymer line. So it has good density to it to where it will get down under the water. It won't sink, it more or less suspends, which is perfect for those baits that you're gonna be fishing shallow uh, near the surface. Has a good amount of stretch and it's near invisible under the water, just like fluorocarbon. Uh, it's got a medium amount of stretch to it, which is gonna give you a little cushion and help you land more fish at longer range. From there, with all of my baits, I'm doing a leader and I want a little tiny barrel swivel. This is a little bit bigger than what I would use, but just a small barrel swivel is gonna keep that line twist out of there. When you're using small baits, if you start to develop line twist, it can make your bait start riding unnatural under the water and not the way it's supposed to. These baits are tuned in perfect conditions by good anglers, so if you don't repeat what they're doing and make sure you don't get line twist, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I'll do that little leader out there and I'm going to use the P-Line 100% fluorocarbon at that point and I like a bare minimal of a three-foot leader. 
Um, what this offers me is 100% fluorocarbon is much more dense. Abrasion value is high. If I rub up against rocks, if I got a lot of fish nipping at it, it's not going to fray nearly as often. And the fluorocarbon is nearly 100% invisible. It's a little bit stiffer right there to where when they do grab on the bait, and for example, I have a double hook set up right here on this wiggle hoochie. If they do grab onto the tail hook, that rear hook won't stretch. The line won't stretch in between to where I'll possibly get a better double penetration with the lead hook and the tail hook. And when I'm using dual hooks, if you look on there, you'll see a little tiny loop knot. That's the double surgeon's loop knot on a little stinger right here. And I'll give you my little trout secret giveaway for these wiggle hoochies and shafts and tackle hoochies to rig these up. If you want to land a heck of a lot more fish in a second here. Yellow bird, doctor spoon. That's okay, I got them. Here's a yellow bird products doctor spoon right here. We're going with this uh, copper finish because it's real heavy overcast. This is uh, the dead of winter. I just put this on about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago. And I just lost a giant and just hooked up this little guy, but uh, they're eating it, man. Never fails. Try to get out a sandwich. Mm -hmm. It's like I want to eat and so do the fish. They call that the lunch bite. Lunch bite? Oh, he's, he's mad. Get angry. Don't, no, don't get angry. Don't fish angry. Don't fish angry. And now he's coming to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, no, he's oh, on another other side. Another giant ten inch. Oh yeah. Oh no, he's fishing the frying pan. Frying pan. It's okay. We have an ego. Yeehaw. The doctor, Doctor Spoon. Feels decent. Uh, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. There you go. That's a better one. I gotta bring the, I gotta bring the fish to you, man. That way. This one's a little bit more solid on the Doctor Spoon. Yellow Bird Products. Now, like I said, pulling combinations of baits. What to pull with what? Well, for example, you look at these flashers right here. When you drop these down into the water and you got a night crawler rigged up behind this guy out there, which is a good choice if the bites are slow. Also, you want to slow down. Flashers will get you bit. When the water's real cold, flashers, fenders, whatever you want to call them, are going to get you bit. You're going to put about a two or three foot leader out behind here with the bait holder hook, a single J hook, and you're going to thread the night crawler on. Just slide them right up the backbone of that hook. Uh, dip them in a scent if you want to to get them bit. These you have to be pulled slow to stay under the surface. You can do like I said and use a half ounce egg weight if you want to, and that'll get about a foot or two down under the surface. I'm trolling these guys about a mile and a half you know, 1.5 miles an hour a lot of the time. That's where I'm pulling my flashers. If you start pulling them too fast, they just get up on the surface, puts too much load on your rod, it's completely unnatural. So when we're going slow like that, you're not gonna get a good action on one of these rip baits or jerk baits. It's not, it's just barely gonna be kicking along. So in combination with flashers, you don't really wanna be pulling rip baits. This is where you wanna go with something else that's extremely subtle and can be pulled at a slow speed. A spoon that's going to sit there and just slowly truck along and wobble might be a good choice. A light, thin spoon, something that's going to get a lot of action at a slow speed is a good choice. Um, smaller spinners, these things spin around at real slow speeds. These are used for kokanee, and everybody knows about 0.8 miles an hour to 1.8 is about what you're doing for kokanee. So kokanee lures work real good at slow speed. So if you're pulling flashers, you can use a kokanee lure in, in connection with that with little tiny spinners on there. We know trout are attracted to spinners. Um, also, you can put on a dodger. You can put a good bend in your dodger and at slow speed, the more bend you put into your dodger, your dodger will kick. And you can put out a little tiny hoochie behind it, a little spinner hoochie, and that's going to throw action into your bait. So you can pull this in combination with the flashers. Um, but you don't want to be pulling something like this that you need speed to throw that action to that. You can either cast this little uh, P-line laser minnow right here or pull it real fast, like I said earlier. Um, along with that, when I'm pulling flashers, 
I'm gonna have a top line out there literally at 150 feet behind the boat with that fly again because I'm going real slow. So this fly is just gonna creep along right on the surface and it'll get that reaction strike for that trout that's feeding. And when they hit the flies, they crush them. Your rod's just sitting dead steady and then BAM! It's really exhilarating. Thing with these doctor spoons, they get big. Another Christmas time rainbow. Ho, 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 frying pan fish. Let's put them in the box. Okay, now when it comes to color selection, in the winter time, you're dealing with constant condition changes. Clear skies, overcast skies, rainy days, the water being clear, the water getting muddied up. Selecting your colors is crucial. First off, I'm gonna start with your metal finishes for your spoons, uh, for your flashers, for your dodgers. Um, basically, how this goes, clear water, clear day, chrome finishes. Overcast days, clear water, brass finishes. Um, overcast days, dirty water, you wanna go with your copper finishes. Um, if you have an, a clear day, but the water's still muddy, you might want to play around with your brass and your copper to see what gets bit at that point. Um, a lot of the time with finishes on your metal things, like um, for example, this spoon right here is hammered. See that little dent pattern in there? A lot of the time that gets to the fish's sensory and they can pick that up on their lateral line a little bit better. Um, so if you're trolling fast or in dirty water, a lot of times spoons with hammered finishes are gonna get you bit a lot more often. A lot of people neglect to make that change, but it does work. Um, the same thing applies with your dodger. Like I said, with the weather, you want to go from your brass, your chromes, to your coppers. And keep that in mind. That plays a much bigger role than most people get a, give it actual credit for. Now getting into there, now we're getting into our colors of our lures. For example, let's look at the shad wrap versus this little uh, wrap of a little shallow runner right here. The shad wrap is in a shad finish. If they're keying in on shad, we know we need to use this guy. That's just matching the hatch. It's plain and simple knowledge. This guy right here has a little bit of, uh, kind of like a little bit of bronze in him, kind of getting towards that brass finish. So now with that being said, we know with that overcast day, they might just be able to see this guy a little bit better. So that's kind of matching those Here's to the hatch, which has nothing to do with the weather conditions. And here's one that can have something to do with the weather conditions. So being able to keep it in mind saying, well, I'm using natural looking patterns, but I'm not getting bit. That's a good time to take a lure that might match that same rule as your metal finishes and give that a shot. Uh, oftentimes that'll trigger them. When you're dealing with really clean water, you have to go with something really natural. Uh, P-Line makes that laser minnow. I mean, this thing couldn't look any more like a real minnow if it had a fin on it. Uh, that'd be the only other thing. The finish on these is amazing. Clear, crystal clear water, clear skies. They're gonna get a good look at your lure. If you're not pulling it ridiculously fast, just force them to react to it. If they come up and take a look, this is the type of lure it's gonna get hit at that point. Um, if the water is really dirty or dingy, a lot of the time like fluorescent pink, and this might be the only thing they can see, a really bright color or a really dark color. Um, another thing with really clear water, you want a complete natural finish. You see this little Shasta Tackle Wiggle Hoochie right here? This looks like a shad. When it's kicking all over, it's got that white. You can see the little red hooks in it, little red finishes. It lo almost looks like a bleeding shad, a wounded shad when they're up close. So clear water, focus on your natural patterns like that. If you're not getting bit on a variety of stuff in clear water, take a look at your speed. You might wanna speed it up to force them to react to it because they could just be getting too good a look at your bait. A lot of the time when the water's slightly dingy or it's overcast outside, you're gonna get away with a lot more. But remember, pay attention to brass finishes for spoons uh, copper finishes for spoons. Like I said, this if you look in the video right here, it's an overcast day. We're beating the tar out of them on that. Um, you look at the chrome flashers right here. 
Chrome wasn't working that day. If it was clear out, it would have. But then I'll go over to this rod right here. And you look at these fenders right here. They have more of a brass look to them. This is the one that was getting picked up. The chrome wasn't getting hit. The brass was. I'm telling you, it can make all the difference in the world. See how fast it came off that cover here? Yeah. for winter trout with Nick the Informative Fisherman. Feel free to call me up on the helpline guys, write me an email, I'll make sure to get back to you. Thank my sponsors for supporting this show. I do it all for you guys and without you guys, I wouldn't have a show, so I appreciate it, thank you very much and thanks for watching guys.